Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Churchill. He's a professor and past chair of the Department of Evolutionary Anthropology at Duke University. He is also an honorary reader in the Evolutionary Studies Institute and Center for Excellence in Paleo Sciences at the University of the Wits. I guess we can. <laughs> say it like that. Yeah, it's a hard yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, he is a paleontologist who studies the fossil record of human evolution, especially that of early members of our genus Homo that lived between about 2 million to 10,000 years ago. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So Dr. Churchill, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on the program. Okay, so uh, when does human evolution start exactly? I mean, because I guess that's uh, there's an ongoing debate also among anthropologists about uh, what is the first human species, correct? Yes. So um, typically we think of, of human evolution as, as beginning. I mean, obviously we share an evolutionary history with all life on the planet. So our evolution begins when all life begins to evolve. But um, we think about... Um, the, the split between the lineage that led to chimpanzees and bonobos and to humans on the other side as being the, the beginning of the, the, the uniquely human story. And based on fossil and genetic evidence, that split was probably somewhere between about five and a half million to seven million years ago. Um, most of us sort of think broadly about six million years ago. Mm -hmm. So the last common ancestor between us and chimpanzees and bonobos. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. And what about the Homo genus specifically? When does it start? Yeah, that's a little bit harder to pin down. Um, there are a couple of fossils in East Africa, one which dates to about 2.6 million, one which dates to about 2.3 million which have been argued to represent the earliest fossils of the genus Homo. Um, there's, they're controversial. Not everyone agrees that they, they are good representatives. Certainly by 2 million years ago, we start finding fossils of the genus Homo quite regularly. So I would put the origins of our genus somewhere around 2 million years ago, although it might be a bit earlier than that. Mm -hmm. And that would be what Homo erectus? Well, that's also interesting because once we start picking up the genus Homo in the fossil record, we see a lot of diversity in species. Mm -hmm. um, and we argue about how many species there are and how do we divide up the, the fossil record. But Homo erectus seems to appear around 2 million years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a species called Homo habilis. There's a species called Homo rudolfensis and Australopithecus sediba, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. Um, some people believe that should also be in the genus Homo, and that appears around 2 million years ago. So it looks like when our genus emerges, there is a little, you know, what we call adaptive radiation. There's a, a, a rapid emergence of new species that occurs around that time. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we have also to take into account that uh, our evolution and the evolution of other species for that matter is not linear. I mean, at the same time, several different species were uh, alive, right? Yes, that's correct. So um, the, the human fossil record, meaning everything on our side of the lineage since that split from chimpanzees six million years ago, mm -hmm. Uh, it's very diverse. We recognize, you know, depending on who you ask, maybe as many as 28 different species um, grouped into seven different genera. Mm. Uh, so our family, our side of the family tree is very, very bushy. Um, and at any given time, there were probably several different hominin species living at one time. And, you know, if you were to go back 100 to 200,000 years ago, there may have been as many as seven different species of humans on, on the earth mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. 
So, uh, interestingly, I've already had several paleoanthropologists on the show, but I never asked this question. So, si and since you focus a lot of your work on morphology, I mean, let's say that you find a new fossil. So, yeah. what is the set of anatomical features that you look to or look for to classify that particular specimen? So... Different species are typically defined by a suite of features, which are unique to that species, or perhaps um, occur in a unique combination in that species. Uh, almost, well, almost without exclusion, they are features in um, the head, cr what we call craniodental features, either features of the dentition, like size and shape of teeth and various cusps and fissures in the teeth or little details of anatomy in the skull. Um, and so um, any species which gets, gets described, the person who announces the species has got to make a case that this is, this is different from everything else that we know in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. And so they'll go through feature by feature and say, well, you know, this species is characterized by this form of that trait, whereas this new thing has got this form. And so this gives us basically the diagnostic tools that, that when we find something new, we can say, oh, wow, you know, this matches basically what we see in other Neanderthals. This is a Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. Or, wow, this doesn't match anything. What are we looking at? Seems to be new. Mm hmm so, I mean, at least to an extent, it derives from a sort of consensus, right? In terms of uh, deciding that each particular species is characterized by a particular set of anatomical features. More or less consensus, yes. So the better known species like Neanderthals, where we have hundreds and hundreds of specimens, I feel, you know, people are fairly well agreed on these are the traits which define a Neanderthal and these are, are, you know, well, these are the defining characteristics. In species that are represented by less material, it's much more contentious. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is always the problem. So uh, a species that I work with a lot in South Africa is a, an Australopithecus species called Australopithecus africanus. And it's, it's highly variable. The features that we use to define it are highly variable. So you will see some of them in one individual, but not other ones. And in another individual, you'll see different characteristics which define the species, but not other ones. Um, so much so that there are some scholars who say, we're actually looking at two different species that we have lumped together. And other scholars say, no, it's one species. It's just a highly variable species. So um, consensus is very hard to to achieve in paleoanthropology, I guess, in any science. Mm -hmm. But that's healthy. So exactly on that same issue of species classification, um, is there any set of criteria that all anthropologists, and more specifically paleoanthropologists and perhaps biological anthropologists, agree on? to establish that uh, a new fossil that they uh, discover correspond to a completely new species? No. Okay. So um, this little guy, Australopithecus sediba, is a, a great example. Um, when we discovered him in 2008, um, you know, we, we went about trying to figure out what it was. And after very, very careful comparison with all of the known fossils in the African fossil record, um, we concluded that this was something which was, was not represented by other known species. So what you do then is you make an argument. Mm -hmm. um, the protocol for naming a new species has some, some um, very fixed elements. You have to adhere to the standards by the International um, Committee on Taxonomic Nomenclature, for example. But basically what you're doing in that paper is you're making an argument that this is a new species. And you do that by making a point by point comparison and saying, yes, this thing differs from all known things in all of these features. 
And at the end of this argument, you hope that you have convinced people that this is something new, but you won't convince everyone. And the most common reaction in paleoanthropology to naming a new species is that people will crop up and say, they shouldn't have named a new species. That's just a representative of Homo erectus. That's just a representative of Australopithecus africanus. Um, you know, so I would not say that there is some, some consensus, that there's some, you know, gold standard that if you reach it, check, we have a new species. And the reality, too, is that sometimes new species are named and then they get subsumed into an existing species um, because further work shows that, okay, they're not as different as we initially thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's very interesting because uh, it just shows that we can still do science and discover new things even though we don't have terms that are uh, very well defined, uh, even species in biology in general. I mean, it went through some changes over the decades. Yeah. Uh, the, one of the perhaps initial definitions was just that uh, two uh, animals of opposite sexes would be able to, pr to interbreed and produce a specimen that would be fertile. Right. But, but now it's more complicated yes. than that. Yes. Uh, also because well, of genetics and all yes. that. Kind of... Well, you know, it's very important to keep in mind that um, things like the concept of a species is exactly that. It's a concept. Yeah. It doesn't mean that nature adheres to that concept. It, it's a mental construct of ours. And um, nature is messy. And it's very hard to put things into neat categories and, and neat phylogenetic trees, you know, family trees and things like that, because nature did, didn't behave that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's say perhaps that it's a useful concept yes. to, to do yes. work on a particular area, but it's not necessarily the case that it can't change over time with new information. Uh, and how do you determine specifically the sex of a particular specimen of a particular fossil? Um, figuring out the sex depends on the, the species that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So in modern humans, and, and pretty much everything from Homo erectus to the present, so archaic humans like the Neanderthals or a group, a species called Homo heidelbergensis or Homo erectus. Um, females tend to be smaller than males, yet they have to give birth to a large-brained baby and a, a large-bodied baby. And because they're smaller and they're shorter and they have these big babies, when a female reaches puberty and she starts to produce um, estrogens, they interact with her growing skeleton and it produces changes in the pelvis to create a larger birth canal. Yeah. Um, and because she's smaller, it's really a relatively larger birth canal. And so there are a whole bunch of, of architectural changes in the pelvis, which we can recognize and fairly reliably determine, okay, that's a female or that's a male. There are also features in the skull. You know, males tend to have stronger muscle markings in the skull, uh, more pronounced brow ridges and things like that. As you go back in time, you know, the Australopiths were much more ape-like and they didn't have big brain babies. And so it's less certain the extent to which we can use those pelvic features. But as you go back in time, there are greater differences in the size between males and females. Uh, so that can be an important clue. Um, outside of humans, if you're dealing with apes, things like canines, males will often have much larger canines than females things like that. So you really, it depends on the species that you're, you're working with. Mm -hmm. But in each particular species and also depending on the fossil you have access to, because many times it's not, of course, the complete skeleton, it's just Correct. parts of the skeleton. Uh, you try to look for what is sexually dimorphic in that particular correct. species, is that it? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. So, what are the Homo species we, you focus the most on? 
most of my career, I had been very, very interested in the Neanderthals of Europe and Western Asia and early modern humans, um, you know, members of our species before about 10,000 years ago. And in particular, you know, how those groups were um, organizing themselves on the landscape, their, their ecology, their subsistence behavior, um, and the contrast in those behavior between the two groups. Um, I uh, am a member of the team that discovered uh, Homo naledi. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have worked a lot on Homo naledi, which is a much more primitive member of the genus Homo, and uh, recently have started doing, you know, become interested in questions with, with Homo erectus. Um, and there's another archaic form called Homo heidelbergensis, which I've also done a bit of work on. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want also to ask you about Australopithecus sediba, but since you're mentioning Homo naledi, tell us a little bit more about the uh, history behind its discovery. I mean, how was it done? Where was it discovered? And where is it placed exactly in relation to other Homo species? Mm -hmm. So... Um... Uh, my colleague, Lee Berger, who I've worked with for more than 25 years uh, and who lives in South Africa, he, uh, so we, we do much of our work in an area outside of Johannesburg called the Cradle of Humankind. And if you want to find human fossils or hominin fossils, as we call them, out in the Cradle of Humankind, you've got to look in caves because that's where um, bones um, tended to accumulate, and that's where they fossilized, and so you look in caves. And um, about 15 years ago, Lee started um, some, some novel approaches to finding cave sites to explore, uh, promising cave sites. One was using the Google Earth landscape feature um, to identify areas which looked good for having caves. That was what led to the discovery of Australopithecus sediba. And the other was to work with local cavers, recreational cavers who were going in these caves for fun. Um, and to basically uh, begin to teach them what to look for to, you know, in case they came across interesting fossils and just to let us know. And fortunately, there was a, a, a fellow who worked with our group, a fellow named Pedro Boshoff, who was already a member of the local caving community. And so through Pedro, we began to work with local cavers. So Homo naledi was found by two cavers, um, Steve Tucker and Rick Hunter, in a cave called Rising Star, which is a well-known cave to cavers in Johannesburg. You know, it's, it's visited a lot. And um, they were at the top of a feature called the Dragon's Back in a narrow little fissure. And in the back of the fissure were some, some speleothems, some stalagmites and stalactites and flowstones. And Rick wanted to get a picture of these speleothems and Steve was in the way. He said, hey, you know, get out, of the, get out of the picture. And Steve noticed there was a, a small fissure to his side and so he squeezed into it. And once he squeezed into it, he realized it continued downwards. So he and Rick squeezed down this little fissure, uh, which got down to about 20 centimeters uh, in places, very, very narrow fissure. And they squeezed all the, the way down um, and found themselves uh, in a chamber and they saw bones down there. And they took photographs and brought the photographs out and that's how Homo naledi was discovered. Mm -hmm. And I mean, by now, it's accepted by the anthropological community as a new species. Correct. Yeah, we, um, uh, we were able to raise money. Well, Lee Berger raised money to do a, an emergency expedition to excavate the material. We thought going in that we had a single skeleton. We could see in the pictures part of a cranial vault. We could see a mandible or lower jaw, and we could see parts of the skeleton below the neck, the postcranial skeleton. So we thought we had a, an associated skeleton, and that's very valuable. When you have different parts together, you can really tell more about the biology 
of these guys. And so um, National Geographic funded a three week um, expedition to remove the skeleton. But it became apparent in the first day of work down in the chamber that we had more than one individual represented by the bones. At the end of three weeks, we had collected um, 1,500 hominin fossils representing at least 15 individuals, ranging in age from newborns to old adults. Um, so that was the material that we worked with. We brought a team of uh, 40 scientists to Johannesburg to work on this material and we announced Homo naledi. Yeah. So we had an enormous amount of material to work with and I think most of the field accepts that this is a novel species and that we were right to, to name it a new species. There are still some, however, who contend that we have just found a fairly primitive form of Homo erectus oh. and that this should be, this should be called Homo erectus. Mm -hmm. By, by the way, and also to try to establish a relationship with other Homo species here, what is the time frame we're talking about when it comes to Homo naledi? I mean, how long ago did it exist? Well, this is the interesting thing. If you look at its anatomy, it's very primitive. It has a small brain, about 550 cubic centimeters. The average for Homo erectus is about 900 cubic centimeters. Hmm. So it has a brain that's about the size of a gorilla's brain. Mm -hmm. uh, it's relatively small bodied. And there are aspects of its anatomy which are very primitive. It has an upturned shoulder joint and long arms and a conical thorax and a wide pelvis. These are features that we see in the Australopiths, the, the little ape men, if you will. Um, it does have some features that are shared with Homo erectus, like the lower limbs are elongated. And we see some mechanisms for more efficient bipedal locomotion in the lower limbs. So it's this interesting mix of very primitive Australopithecus-like features and more derived Homo-like features. When we were finally able to date the sediments at the cave, we were shocked because it came out at a, uh, somewhere between um, 330,000 and 250,000 years ago. Oh, really? Yes. So roughly a quarter of a million years ago, um, our own species, Homo sapiens, had emerged by that time. Yeah, that, uh, that's why I was surprised yes. right now to know that because, I mean, uh, the, our species appear, appeared uh, around 200 to 300,000 years ago. Yes, right. yes. So here are the interesting, some of the, the interesting things about Homo naledi. And this is the beautiful thing about paleoanthropology is that it is a very dynamic field. We're discovering new things all the time. And those things are forcing us to sort of rethink, um, you know, some of the long held ideas in the field. So Homo naledi is very primitive. So those who say, oh, it's just Homo erectus. Well, it's more primitive than Homo erectus that we're picking up in Africa at 1.5 million in some respects. So you would have to argue that brain size got smaller in Homo erectus over time. Um, aspects of its anatomy got more primitive over time which is a possible, but a hard argument to make. The other thing is that if you look at the details of the, the anatomy in the craniofacial skeleton, it clusters with later members of the genus Homo. Um, it forms a, a clade or a little branch on the family tree with us with a species called Homo antecessor, which is probably the last common ancestor of modern humans and Neanderthals, and with Neanderthals. Um, so it's a curious, curious critter. Very, very primitive, but in some ways it resembles us more than it resembles Homo erectus. Hmm, that's very interesting. So could that have uh, any direct implications to the timeline we have for the evolution of uh, our own species and its ancestors? 
I think the, the, the most plausible interpretation for Homo naledi is that it is a species which split off from other lineages in the genus Homo very early in time, hmm. um, possibly before the emergence of Homo erectus. So around the time when we see that little um, uh, radiation, we have Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo erectus, Australopithecus sediva. Homo naledi probably comes out of that cloud. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, it remains relatively, you know, morphologically primitive uh, throughout time. And it, it lives until 250,000 years ago or so. So uh, in that respect, people will refer to it as a relic species, um, a, a species which is diverged early and then didn't change very much over time. But during that existence, it interbred mm. with other members of the genus Homo, in, including perhaps our species or, or ancestors of our species. Mm. And what's interesting is a work that's been done on the genome of um, uh, people who are indigenous to Africa. Well, I guess we're all indigenous to Africa, but to, to um, sub-Saharan African populations, identify what they call a ghost lineage which is a, a very early primitive representative which contributed genetically to our lineage. Mm -hmm. That could be Naledi, or it could be that there's a lot of other things out there that are like Naledi, we just have never discovered them. Right. If that uh, makes sense. Yes, it makes. I, I mean, I was just trying many things that came to my mind now, because, I mean, I was just thinking about... Uh, the, the ancestors of Homo sapiens and the best estimate for the location where Homo sapiens appeared that I think like two years ago there was a big paper that came out that positioned us as originated in Botswana or somewhere around there, I think. Interesting. Uh, so, but, yeah, but, uh, I, I was tr I was trying to, of course, I, I, perhaps I don't know enough of paleoanthropology here, but I was just trying to see if Homo naledi could have in some way been a direct ancestor of Homo sapiens, if that would even be a possibility. Um, it's certainly a possibility. I find it unlikely mm. because um, it would mean that um, Homo sapiens had to evolve in parallel a lot of features that we see in Homo erectus and other archaic hominins like Homo heidelbergensis, mm. um, Neanderthals, yeah. because Naledi is so primitive. And so we would have had to evolve, evolve those very rapidly. I think it is more parsimonious to think that we evolved from, from something like Homo heidelbergensis, which traces back to Homo erectus, but perhaps with some genetic contribution from these other lineages like Homo naledi. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, basically the timeline runs from Homo erectus to Homo heidelbergensis to Homo sapiens, and then because Homo erectus migrated out of Africa, it gave rise also to species like the Denisovans and the Neanderthals, and those interbred with Homo sapiens. Yes. So um, it's, it's convenient to try to think of the evolution of, of, um, of our side of the family tree as a bush or a tree. And, you know, we're on one terminal branch of that, that bush. And so then it's tempting to say, okay, I can follow this branch back down to the root and maybe to, to the last common ancestor six million years ago. I think most of us would agree that we evolved from something like Homo heidelbergensis, mm -hmm. which in turn evolved from something like Homo erectus. Not everyone would agree with that, but I think most people would. And that 
Homo heidelbergensis or something like it, uh, Homo an antecessor, antecessor uh, um, species, which was identified in Spain, might be the last common ancestor. The Neanderthals split from us on the order of uh, half a million years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And then the Denisovans arose, uh, the Neanderthals and Denisovans split. So the okay. Denisovans are more closely related to Neanderthals mm -hmm. than either is to us. So it's convenient to think that way, but we know from the genetics and we also know from living species like baboons that there's a lot of introgression. There's a lot of interbreeding that's occurring between these lineages. Yeah. And so it's much, much more accurate, I think, to think of, to, to use a metaphor of a braided stream rather than a bush, where you have these, these channels which are moving through time, but interconnecting with other channels through little rivulets and little streams, and there's genetic mixing going on. And it makes it very, very complicated to try to sort out a nice, neat little picture of who gave rise to, to who. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, uh, is Homo heidelbergensis also an ancestor of Neanderthals and Denisovans or, or not? Yes. Um, so, uh, it, again, it depends on who you ask. There are many who would say that Homo erectus gave rise to Homo heidelbergensis. Mm -hmm. The European branch and, and the European branch of Homo heidelbergensis evolved into Neanderthals and Denisovans. Mm -hmm. The African branch of Homo heidelbergensis evolved into Homo sapiens. Yeah. Okay. There are others who would say, no, there was a species called Homo antecessor. And antecessor gave rise to a European branch, mm -hmm. which gave rise to the Neanderthals. And if you recognize the species between antecessor and Neanderthals, that would be appropriately named Homo heidelbergensis. And then antecessor gave rise in Africa to our lineage, and the intermediate species would be called Homo rhodesiensis. So many people lump heidelbergensis and rhodesiensis into a single species, heidelbergensis. Mm -hmm. Very little consensus on these matters. <laughs> Yeah, I guess they are very complicated and uh, you also have to work with an incomplete picture of things okay. because, of course, uh, we basically accumulate knowledge as more fossils appear, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So tell us now about Australopithecus sediba then. Uh, what's that species and... Uh, tell us also about the timeline there. Yeah. So um, Australopithecus sediba, the first fossils were found by eight-year-old Matthew Berger, the son of my colleague Lee Berger. Um, they had gone out into the field to, um, to basically check some cave sites that Lee had identified on Google Earth. And uh, while Lee and a, um, a colleague of ours, Job Kibbe, were, who was also there with them, were getting ready to, to figure out, okay, how are we going to go about exploring these caves? Uh, Matthew went running off in the bush and he tripped over a rock and he looked at the rock and he saw a fossil in it and he said, hey, dad, I found a fossil. And it turned out it was a clavicle or collarbone of Australopithecus sediba. And that's kind of significant because a lot of mammals don't have a collarbone. Primates retain the collarbone. It's a very primitive primitive bone. Um, and uh, in, in the end, we recovered partial skeletons of two individuals. Um, we refer to them as Malapahominins 1 and 2. And this was in 2008. By 2010, we announced a new species, Australopithecus sediba. So it, it was wonderful. When we, we first found the material, um, one thing that we had was a, the lower jaw of Malapahominin 1, a mm -hmm. partial lower jaw. And based on the size and shape of the teeth and some other features of the jaw, our initial thinking was that we were looking at a South African fossil of Homo habilis. 
And Homo habilis is not well known in South Africa. In fact, there's really only one one specimen which has possibly been attributed to Homo habilis, and it's it's a rather a problematic specimen. Uh, but then as we uncovered more of the, the two individuals and started doing the comparison, our first thing was to compare it to everything known in the South African fossil record, which is convenient for us because it was all right there in South Africa. So we, we, we did that work and we could very, very clearly show that this was not within the range of variation of the known species in South Africa. Then we went up to East Africa. Uh, we went to the Kenya National Museum and compared it to specimens of Homo habilis, um, uh, early Homo erectus, Homo rudolfensis, um, the South, the East, some of the East African Australopithecus specimens, and we were quite convinced it was different from those as well. Mm -hmm. And so we felt justified in naming a new species. By this time, we saw that there were enough primitive features in the skeletons of these two individuals that we felt it should go in the genus Australopithecus rather than in the genus Homo. But it shared many, many features with the genus Homo. And our interpretation of that is that it is either the species that gave rise to the genus Homo or it is very closely related to the species that gave rise to the genus Homo. So that is why we chose the specific name Sediba. That's the Sisutu term, one of the South African languages, meaning source or spring, wellspring. And it reflects our thinking that this is the source of our branch of the family tree. Now, of course, a lot of our colleagues don't buy that argument, particularly colleagues who work in East Africa, who think that the locus of the emergence of the genus Homo is in East Africa. But again, such is the nature of science, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but I mean, the Australopithecines in general, or the, the Australopithecus genus, I think we can say yes. it like that. Uh, that's the oldest genus uh, of, homin of hominin? Or... No, there are actually some earlier one. So as we approach that magical six million year hazy window of when chimpanzees um, and humans diverged, we pick up some, some fossils, a very, very scrappy fossil record back there. But um, the, the earliest material has been put into three different genera. Um, and just for those who are interested, the, those genera are Artipithecus, uh, Sahelanthropus and Auroran. Um, yeah. 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 But because, uh, I, I mean, of course, we have our last common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos. But, I mean, that last common ancestor, it wouldn't be classified as an hominin, or would it? Well, that's a, that's a difficult question. If we find something that's very close to the split yeah. and it shares features with us that you don't see in chimpanzees, mm -hmm. it's fair to, to classify it as a hominin. If we find something that really is a great candidate for the last common ancestor, it would need its own um, subfamily designation. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it would necessarily, I guess, have to share uh, traits that yes. belong both to the Homo genus and the genus which chimpanzees and yes. bonobos are part of. Yeah. So um, members on our side of the family tree are hominins. Members on the chimp bonobo side of the family tree are, are um, paninins, panins. Um, I'm not quite sure which yeah, is Yeah, I know that pan and so, is somewhere there. <laughs> yeah. So the last common ancestor would be neither of those, right? So it would need its, its own little name. Mm -hmm. So uh, another question. We've been focusing mostly on anatomy here, but to talk more about behavior and sociality, 
uh, because of course specifically paleoanthropologists I know that some of them don't focus exclusively on hominin species they also do a bit of primatology and study chimpanzees bonobos and even other uh, primate species uh, particularly the great apes that split from our lineage earlier than chimpanzees and bonobos uh, to, to what extent do you think it's useful to compare homo species with other great apes and primates i mean can we learn something more or is there some information we can add to the picture by studying those other animals yes i think it's very useful it depends of course on the questions that you're trying to answer um, but doing comparisons i think teaches us a lot about ecology about adaptive behavior about cognitive evolution um, you know a, a couple of examples um, and the choice of species is going to depend on your your comparison mm -hmm. in some cases it's useful to compare humans to to great apes in other cases it might be useful to compare humans to baboons or to dogs so um, with baboons for example, um, baboons are an interesting model for human evolution because baboons, like hominins, are open country adapted primates, large bodied primates. And so um, their evolution, and, and particularly the evidence for um, considerable interbreeding between different species of baboons, I think is a really good model for what early hominin evolution was like. Um, Dogs share some cognitive features with humans that we do not see in great apes. Mm -hmm. um, and so they become an interesting model for like human cognitive evolution. So it's very, very useful to, to do those comparisons. And it's also very useful. Um, we think of ourselves as being unique in a lot of things our intelligence, our technology, our, our material culture, language, all of these things. And it's, it's very useful to sort of ask the question, are we really unique in these things? Or is it just the extent to which we carry the behavior that's unique, that, that makes us seem unique? And tool use is a great example. Prior to the 1960s, it was sort of widely thought that humans were the only animal that made and used tools. Yeah. And we now know it's been tool use and, and even tool making has been widely documented in a lot of different animals. And so it, it becomes apparent that what's interesting about us is not the fact that we use tools, but that we have become so dependent upon them. We, we literally cannot survive without tool use. And we've pushed it so far that we have this sort of infinite toolkit that we've done wonderful things with. So I think those comparisons are enormously useful. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think that perhaps there are several things that we can think about here. For example, it makes perfect sense to compare ourselves to the species that are the most phylogenetically close to us. Because, yes. I mean, there's uh, ev in evolution, there's always preservation. I mean, if a trait works well in a given species i, I mean uh, if the species it gives rise to or the species that splits from it evolves in a similar context context or is exposed to similar evolutionary pressures then in principle that trait will be preserved and also, uh, but also, I mean, when you mentioned, for example, dogs and baboons, one thing that came to my mind was convergent evolution. I mean, yes. it's, it's not that we have to circumscribe ourselves to great apes or primates, because even species that are more uh, distant from each other, if they are exposed again, to similar selective pressures, then can they can evolve similar or close traits, right? That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Um, 
since you mentioned convergent evolution, it is um, it is a wonderfully difficult problem for us in paleoanthropology because we we use the uh, fact that two different groups share a feature as evidence that they share a relationship. Yeah. But if they evolve those two features independently mm -hmm. but through convergence, yeah. it gives us a false signal. And it looks like from, from studying the great apes and, and human evolution, it looks like there was a lot of convergence going on. You know, if you take animals which are genetically similar to one another um, and you put them in similar ecological circumstances, it's not unreasonable to imagine that they will evolve similar solutions, anatomical solutions and behavioral and physiological solutions to those adaptive challenges. And um, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Um, Australopithecus sediba has a pelvis which is um, much more like ours than other members of the genus Australopithecus. Homo nomadi has a pelvis which is much more like um, Australopithecus. And we know from features in the skull that Homo naledi is more closely related to us than Australopithecus sediba. So that tells us that the similarities in the pelvis of Australopithecus sediba are converging. Yeah. But to me, that's interesting because I'm interested in, in function and ecology and behavior. And that means that those features in the pelvis evolve because if they evolve because of convergence, that natural selection was operating on those features. And it means that they are meaningful with respect to function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that also came to my mind, convergent evolution, because back in 2018, I had a conversation with a comparative psychologist, Dr. Jennifer Vonk, and we talked about uh, corvids and it's interesting because I mean with such small brains because of the selective pressures the social selective pressures they are exposed to they have some cognitive traits that are very very close to the great apes and humans so. yeah yeah they have a brain that's this big yeah, but they're incredible tool users, and they have an incredible ability to solve problems through tool use. They are they are remarkable animals. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really amazing. So, uh, another question that I guess is a big one in our evolution: What is behavioral modernity, and when did we become behaviorally modern? I mean, what does it mean even to be behaviorally modern? Yeah. Um, different people might answer this question differently. I think of, uh, I, I follow Alison Brooks and Sally McGreary, who argued that it sort of boils down, behavioral modernity boils down to four cognitive traits. Um, the ability for abstract thought, um, you know, that is to, to imagine things which are not in the here and now, you know, which are not in concrete reality. Um, and we have different archaeological signatures of these behaviors. So, for instance, at a German site called Vogelherr, which dates to about 30,000 or, or so years ago, there's a little human figurine carved out of ivory with a lion head. Okay, nobody ever saw a person walking around with the head of a lion. So that clearly is an example of abstract thought. Mm -hmm. The second feature is symbolic behavior the ability to encode information or meaning in symbols. So items of personal adornment, for example, we take to be evidence of symbolic behavior because you're encoding something about your group membership or your social status or your personality in these, these items that you're wearing. Um, language, a lot of people think of language as a separate feature, but language is just symbolic behavior. Right, um, the, the phonemes that we combine into words, those words are just symbols that represent different things. So language is a, is a sort of a hyper symbolic behavior. Um, greater innovativeness, you know, the ability to, to imagine new tools and, and new solutions. And then planning depth, the ability to, to sort of use your knowledge of what unfolded in the past 
to make reasonable predictions about what will happen in the future and to, to plan for that. So that's kind of what we talk about as, as the package of, of modern behaviors or modern, modern cognitive traits. Mm -hmm. uh, and what do you think about the role that self-domestication might have played in our evolution? I mean, there are people like Richard Rangham who have very strong arguments for it in terms of uh, I mean, for example, the feminization of our facial features yes. and our uh, becoming more or less reactively violent and more proactively violent, as he, ma he makes that yes. distinction there. Uh, I mean, do you think that those there's good evidence that self-domestication played a big role in our evolution? Um, I believe that there is. Now, uh, in addition to Richard Rangham, um, Brian Hare is also a big proponent mm -hmm. of, yeah. and he's here in my department. In fact, I'm in my lab right now, and my lab is sandwiched between, he, he, he wor also works on canine cognition. And so the canine cognition lab is on one side, and the puppy lab, um, they, they do work with puppies, uh, is on the other side. So I, I've been influenced a lot by my conversations with, with Brian. But look, Humans are remarkably socially tolerant. You know, you can walk into a theater and, and sit down with 500 strangers and no fights will break out, hopefully. Um, you know, maybe if it's a football match or something like that, <laughs> fights may break out. But, um, you know, if you put 500 strange chimpanzees in a room together, there would be bloodshed and okay. probably... 499 chimpanzees would end up dead. Uh, so we are remarkably socially tolerant. We are remarkably altruistic. Yes, it is true. We are capable of, of horrible uh, interpersonal violence and, and egregious behavior. But the flip side of the coin is we are remarkably pro-social. Uh, we have an incredible ability to cooperate and to help one another, um, to work together, to, to reach uh, common goals. Uh, so I think that um, there had to have been throughout our evolution um, a change in social tolerance from a chimpanzee-like condition to, to our condition. I think that it was probably relatively gradual that, um, you know, Homo erectus probably had more social tolerance than, than Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis. But I do think um, based on the fossil evidence that there was a significant jump in social tolerance within our own species over the course of the last 300,000 years. Because if you look at um, specimens from you know, 300 to 100,000 years ago of Homo sapiens, you find much larger brow ridges, you find more masculinized faces, which uh, su suggests to me that there was greater testosterone reactivity. Um, and our faces, males today look like females did 100,000 years ago, our, mm -hmm. our craniofacial skeleton. And we refer to that as feminization. And I think that is a true marker, a, a true reflection of the fact that we've become self-domesticated, that more violent, more aggressive individuals had lower fitness. They didn't reproduce as well. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, when it comes to the mechanisms that explain uh, how self-domestication occurred, I mean, could it have been through sexual selection? I mean, just the females preferring males who had, for example, more self-control or were less violent? Or, as Richard Rangham proposes, social selection by people from uh, different groups, uh, basically eliminating the most violent individuals. There's a number of different ways this could have occurred. Yes, it could have been sexual selection. It could have been that females um, were attracted to males that they felt would be better providers that you know, males who were more cooperative and, and um, 
you know, she might have judged to be someone who's going to provision her offspring. Um, it could be, as Rangham said, that um, language facilitated cooperation in dealing with bullies, yeah. in dealing with the more violent individuals. And they were ostracized or murdered in their sleep or something like that. Um, there's a fellow named Binghamton who's argued that the evolution of projectile weaponry, which seems to emerge maybe about 100,000 years ago in Africa, may have facilitated um, dealing with bullies. And his argument is that if, if you have to have close contact with someone in order to subdue them, it's hard to recruit people to help you because um, if I'm going to if I'm going to deal with the bully who's bigger and stronger than I am, uh, and all I have is a, a handheld spear and he's got a handheld spear, um, the probability that I'm going to get hurt is very high. Mm -hmm. If I add another member, the probability of getting hurt is divided in two, but it's only divided in two. So it's hard to recruit that second person. Once you get the second person, it's easier to recruit the third because now you know, so, but the, the reduction in risk is going down linearly. But with projectile weapons, you can spread out. And now I can attack the person from, from different positions. And so now the risk of getting injured actually goes down as the square of the number of, of people. And so it's easier to recruit people to deal with the bullies. So, um, uh, Bingham has argued that projectile weapons might have been an important component of self-domestication. And since I work on the evolution of projectile weapons, I kind of like that idea. <laughs> yes, I understand. So one last question, and of course, throughout our conversation, and I always try to do that when I have paleoanthropologists on the show to, to be careful about uh, showing people that we do not have a complete picture of our evolution and I mean I don't know if we will ever be completely sure of how it happened how it unfolded uh, and there are many uncertainties but I mean how speculative with the knowledge that we have now at least how speculative would you say is the history of our evolution mm -hmm. that's a great question um, we have an enormous fossil record of human evolution. Mm. Um, I have thousands of replicas in, in my lab, and it's just a small fraction of the actual fossil record of, of human evolution. Um, we have a massive archaeological record of human behavior. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't really start until humans start making stone tools about two and a half to three million years ago. Um, we are we have an increased genetic record. Um, so we have a lot of data to work with. Now what's problematic is that that data needs to be interpreted. Mm -hmm. And two people can look at the same evidence and come to very, very different conclusions about that evidence. Uh, you know, it's a function of the fact that we bring different thought processes into the analysis. We bring differences in training. Um, differences in paradigms, the way that we think about things or interpret things. And um, as new evidence is added, it sort of forces re-examination of interpretations. Um, will we ever get to the point that we're all, there's a, a, an absolute consensus? I don't know. I would say that the broad brushstrokes of human evolution are fairly well established that you know, we split from the lineage leading to chimpanzees and bonobos, roughly 6 million, you know, again, 5.5 to 7 million years ago, that for the first uh, two thirds of our time as a separate lineage, we were largely ape men, meaning you know, if you saw us, you'd go, okay, that's pretty much an ape, behaviorally an ape, anatomically an ape, ecologically an ape, but they're walking on two legs, okay? They're, they're weird apes. And then over the last two million years, the genus Homo originated and brains got bigger, technology got more com complex and we became increasingly technologically dependent. So everybody would agree on those broad brushstrokes. 
Um, it's just a matter of the, the finer details of, of how it all fits together and works that we disagree on. Mm -hmm. Yes, and by the way, Ed, I hope you also agree with me here. Uh, I mean, this is not a good enough reason, I mean, th that we have incomplete evidence or incomplete knowledge of our evolutionary history. It's not a good enough reason to completely tear down the edifice of paleoanthropology or, right. or paleontology or even evolutionary biology more generally because, uh, I mean, evidence accumulates and from different sources, like for example, Darwin did back in the origin of species, he collected evidence from many different sources to make an argument, a very powerful argue, argument for evolution by natural selection. And this is pretty much the approach we have here in paleoanthropology and related sciences. Right? That's right. And people often point to the fact that there is a lot of disagreement in the field as somehow indicating that it's all bogus or something like that. But this is a healthy thing. Yeah. Science is, is, you know, our, our um, increasing understanding of the way the natural wor world works is based on a scientific method which depends on people not believing one another. You know, I say, hey, I, you know, here's my explanation for, for how this piece of the world or the universe works. And somebody says, I think you're, you're crazy. And they set out to prove me wrong. And then we learn something new. Um, so it's actually healthy that there's a little disagreement and that we're all, we're pushing each other and we're, you know, and if it, if it becomes personal or nasty, that's not good. But the extent to which we can do it with a, a sense of collegiality and um, uh, right-mindedness. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I also wanted to make that point clear because particularly in the United States, I know that you have a re fairly recent history of uh, debates between creationists and evolutionists and even in the yeah. education system it was very complicated so I mean this is good science and it's how science is done yes so yes yeah okay so uh, before we go would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet um, yes so um... If um, you simply, um, well, if you were to Google um, Homo naledi or Australopithecus sediba or even Neanderthals, um, my articles will pop up, particularly if you do it in something like Google Scholar or um, some sort of academic browser like Web of Science, um, my articles will pop up. Um, you can also visit um, my department website, Evolutionary Anthropology at Duke University, and click on my faculty profile and find more information about my work. Okay, so Dr. Churchill, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show, and it's been a pleasure and really fun to talk to you. Thank you so much. It has been a lot of fun. Take care now. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month, so it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Ginty, Zurtger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Kavanagh, 
Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punta, Radana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saim Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC, My Producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardus France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.